Sí. My name is Nicola and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoyed this podcast, you can show your support by either writing a brief review on iTunes or by simply making a donation. Today, my guest on the show is Professor Joshua Bach. Joshua is a cognitive scientist at the Harvard Program for Evolutionary Dy Dynamics, as well as the MIT Media Lab. So, welcome to Singularity FM, Joshua. Hi. First of all, I'm not a professor, though. And um, as, uh, I've been working at the MIT Media Lab um, until um, so years ago. And since then, I'm at Harvard. But I'm not affiliated at both at this, at this time. Oh, so what, what exactly is your position, then? I'm a research scientist. A research scientist is a person that works in the abyss between postdoc and tenure. Wow, but you are a PhD. I am. <laughs> and what, what, what was your PhD in? Yeah. Uh, in cognitive science, I went into academia to understand how the mind works and so studied a number of uh, subjects and did uh, degrees in computer science and philosophy and felt that AI is my best bet of making headway in understanding who we are. Fantastic. So uh, you are, as you said, in the zero gravity sort of space between postdoc and professorship? Academia? Yeah, it's actually a quite happy place. It's, it's one that allows me to do what I want. I don't have to do superfluous management. I don't have to sit in many committees or anything. I can teach when I want, but I don't have to, which is really the best arrangement you can possibly have. I can have students, but I don't have to. And uh, so this is kind of amazing. That's fantastic, but I don't know how if, if it's uh, allowing you to survive with your family properly. But We find out, you know. There can always be earthquakes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Joshua. If I were to ask you to introduce yourself in a couple of words, who is Joshua Bach? It depends who's asking. But uh, in, in the most general sense, um, I'm a cognitive scientist. I grew up in communist Eastern Germany, the last generation to do so, as the um, child of an artist in the forest. And I uh, grew up in a world that was completely alien to me in, in many ways, because communist Eastern Germany didn't make a lot of sense, especially if you grow up in a forest in which everything has no rules and uh, only the rules that locally make sense. So in a way, my default in understanding the world has been different from the default of people around me. I reluctantly discovered that most people form their ideas by taking in the norms of their environment and the statements of the experts and taking them as gospel and only revise them when they absolutely have to, when they're disproven. And for me, it was always like the opposite. You have this uh, perspective on the world where people have ideas and their thoughts and they often make no sense. And you will have to look at each of them with great care before you incorporate them into your own world model. So you, no. you try to be careful to not be, harm anything or do bad things to the world, but uh, this reluctance in accepting what, what comes from the outside has, I think, shaped my scientific perspective. And when I came into the next society, Western Germany, and then later on to New Zealand and to the US, uh, I always saw things from the outside. So I'm more an observer, and the same thing happens in the scientific fields. Wow, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. And I want to grab a few points there one by one. But first of all, uh, that kind of a skeptical outsider kind of point of view is very contrarian and, and it's also very sort of philosoph well, philosophical in the way maybe in the German school because at least Nietzsche said that uh, gross answers are a prohibition against thinkers. You shall not think. And to him, that was like an insult because he was uh, a, a curious uh, questioning inquisitive kind of a soul from the beginning uh, and so uh, he was never one for gross answers but rather uh, asking questions and, 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 and questioning everything so it seems you've kind of you've got that approach I felt that Nietzsche never made peace with society and that was related to the fact that he was never able to make peace with himself it really need, uh, never worked out there is a big issue with obedience, this question, should you obey somebody else? I mean, you seem to have that same issue, that uh, to work in a hierarchy, 
you need to submit in a way to a hierarchy. How would you submit? How could somebody else make your decisions if they didn't test it to the same rigorous epistemological criteria that you did? Does that have integrity, right? It's very hard to do. But from a different perspective, if you want to do the right thing, then doing the right thing might require uh, that you ask the person that is more likely to, to make the right decisions because they're an expert for a local area of making the right things. Like a leader is a person in specializing that specializes in doing the right thing. So I think it has integrity to realize um, that in certain circumstances, other people will know better than you do. And Nietzsche never got to this point. And of, of course, philosophy is slightly different because in philosophy, you have to fix your foundations and arguably in Western philosophy, very few people did. Right? Yeah. So our null hypothesis still seems to be supernatural beings and dualism and so on. And that's one of the reasons why most people in the Western world find AI is so ridiculous and unlikely. It's not because people don't see that we are biological computers and that the universe is probably mechanical and the theory that everything is mechanical gives extremely good predictions. It's because deep down they still have this null hypothesis that the universe is somehow supernatural and we are the most supernatural thing in it. And science is only reluctantly pushing back against this null hypothesis. And since it has not completely obliterated the null hypothesis in this single area, the conscious, consciousness in the mind, we are reluctant in accepting the certainty, this reasonable certainty that we are machines. But this is the main reason why we hesitate so much, I think. So are we machines then? Are we, uh, are we as some people have said, that uh, organisms are algorithms? There are a number of definitions on this, but if you think of an algorithm as... Uh, a set of rules that can be probabilistic or deterministic and that um, make it possible to switch between states. And usually we do this in a more narrow sense where we say that um, the algorithm is being used to change representational states in order to compute a function, right? Then I would say that organisms have algorithms in this narrower sense. Mm -hmm. But I would say that in the wider sense, they're definitely machines. A machine is a system that can change way, uh, state in non-random ways. And also uh, revisit earlier states, which means to stay in a particular state space. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, this would not be a system. A system is something that we can describe by uh, drawing a fence around its state space and saying, as long as it's in there, this is the system. Right? So we have an evolution of the system that is somewhat constrained. Now we are jumping headfirst into terminology. Want, want to go there? Uh, we would go there, but let me just roll back the tape of time because I want to follow your narrative, your personal narrative from where it began, mm -hmm. then connect it to where you are today, and then hopefully try and look it to the world and into the future with your eyes and with your experience and from your point of view. So tell me, you said you grew up in the forest? Mm -hmm. Whereabouts? Uh, in Thuringia, near Weimar and Jena. It's an area of German Romanticism, which had a pretty big influence on how I grew up. Uh, it's a very particular shape of the soul that has been characterized by the Enlightenment, which um, in a way um, pushed back against the religious mind virus that had controlled the world until then and replaced it with machinery. This rationalist machinery that uh, eventually made modernist societies possible. And this was a very big upheaval. You can still see the echo of this in our modern myths like Lord of the Rings and Star Wars. You have this pastoral world which defends itself against the encroaching technological empire that is going to eat our souls, even though it's going to win. And, and so, but did you grow up on a farm or something? No, my parents were artists. They were originally architects. And my father uh, didn't want to build um, boring things that would put people into boxes and deny their humanity. Instead, he built things that didn't have many right angles. And um, he made a zoo that uh, had no right angles, for instance, as one of his projects and so on. Wow. And it was very difficult to, uh, to uh, get away with these things in Eastern Germany because this was a very utilitarian society and its architecture was to a large degree brutalist. Yeah. So uh, he rejected this and he decided to remove himself from society and make his own kingdom in the forest. So he bought an old water mill and changed it into a sculpture garden and um, lived exactly the life he wanted and got away with it. Wow, that's absolutely phenomenal. I, I 
like you, grew up in the Eastern Bloc, only I grew up in Bulgaria, in communist Bulgaria for the first, what was it, 13, 14 years of my life. Uh, so I can associate with a lot of your experience. But it's very interesting how you grew up in Germany, as you put it, in the forest, in a very artistic family, and yet you became a scientist. So is there any tension there, or is it a continuation of sort of, or, or did it give you any kind of different, unique point of view or approach to science, or is that basically a false dichotomy? There is a big similarity. Um, I find that most people um, serve practical needs. They have an understanding of the difference between meaning and relevance. And at some level, my mind is more interested in meaning than in relevance. That is similar to the mind of an artist. The arts are not life. They're not serving life. The arts are the cuckoo child of life. Because the meaning of life, they are the cuckoo child of life. The meaning of life is to eat. You know, life is evolution. And evolution is about eating. It's pretty gross if you think about it, right? Evolution is about getting eaten by monsters. Don't go into the desert and perish there because it's going to be a waste. If you're lucky, the monsters that eat you are your own children. And eventually the search for evolution will, if evolution uh, reaches its global optimum, it will be the perfect devourer. The thing that is able to digest anything and turn it into structure to sustain um, its, and perpetuate itself for as long as the local puddle of neck entropy is available. And in a way, we are yeast. Everything we do, all the complexity that we create, all the structures we build is to erect some surfaces on which to outcompete other kinds of yeast. And if you realize this, you can try to get behind this. And I think the solution to this is fascism, right? Fascism is a mode of organization of society in which the individual is a cell and a superorganism. And the value of the individual is exactly the contribution to the superorganism. And when the uh, contribution is negative, then the superorganism kills it in order to be fitter in the competition against other superorganisms. And it's totally brutal. And I don't like fascism because it is going to kill a lot of minds I like. And the arts is slightly different. It's a mutation that is arguably not completely adaptive. It's one where people fall in love with the lost function, where you think that your mental representation is the intrinsically important thing, where you try to capture a conscious state for its own sake, because you think that matters. A true artist, in my view, is somebody who captures conscious states, and that's the only reason why they eat. So you, you eat to make art. And a noble person makes uh, art to eat. And it's, uh, these are, of course, the ends of a spectrum, and the truth is often somewhere in the middle. But in a way, there is this fundamental distinction. And there are, uh, in some sense, the two scientists which are, try to f figure out something about the universe. They try to reflect it. And it's an artistic process, in a way. It's an attempt to be a reflection to this universe. You see, there's this amazing, vast darkness, which is the universe. There's all this iteration of patterns, but mostly there's nothing interesting happening in these patterns. It's a giant fractal, and most of it is just boring. And in a brief moment in the evolution of the universe, there are planetary surfaces and neck entropy gradients that allow for the creation of structure. And then there are some brief flashes of consciousness in the, all this vast darkness. And these brief flashes of consciousness can reflect the universe and maybe even figure out what it is. It's the only chance that we have. Right? This wow. is amazing. And um, why not do this? I mean, life is short. This is the thing that we can do. And that's why you, going back to your previous point about your current position being sort of between postdoc and, and academia, that position actually fits you very well because you're not forced to um, do science in order to eat, but actually you can afford to eat as much as you can do your science. Is that the case? I have a similar problem as you, I think. Um, it's very difficult for me to get myself to do something for which I'm not intrinsically motivated for. So, Absolutely, uh, yeah. You got that right completely. <laughs> if I uh, work in a job that is intellectually interesting but doesn't appear meaningful to me, I will probably lose interest after four months. Yeah. And I have to do something where I think this needs to be done. This is worth spending some of my short life on. 
right i don't even uh i don't i didn't even last four months you know after my undergraduate before my master's degree i worked as an investment administrator in a company and i lasted six weeks uh, where i was balancing portfolios and doing stock trades and things like that i lasted about five and a half six weeks and then it's a debate whether i resigned or i got fired first <laughs> but either way i was not s surviving there so or staying there anyway yeah There is a tension. I want to be useful to society and I want to ease suffering and so on. I do care about people. And it's just that I have the impression that the systems that we live in are uh, often not sustainable. They're largely doomed. Right? It's a very weird situation that we find ourselves in. If you take a step back, um, all the important tipping points for climate change have been in the last century, as people said in the last century. right? But uh, the fact that we knew about this that global warming is basically known to our uh, corporations, the oil companies, since the 60s and 70s, and to our governments, I think, to about the same time, that the, our inability to deal with this is probably means that there was too little agency in the system to do anything about it, and we probably locked ourselves into this trajectory with the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. At this point, it was no longer for us to stop the machines that we built. Well, we are kind of jumping forward, and I want to sort of slow the ball down a little bit if 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 i may um hmm. <laughs> don't worry you're not going to get bored you can keep that pace <laughs> you just can turn around and go as i'm else <laughs> fantastic the pace is great it's just that i had so many considerations already in my previous points that you made that that now i i kind of lost the thread completely um okay let me see Where does, so we, we got the artistic and the scientific part of Joshua. So where's, where does philosophy come about here in this equation and, and how? That's a very awkward question. The problem is, in my view, that philosophy um, as a field of inquiry is practically dead. Misha Gromov once told me, he's a mathematician, that in his perspective, Darwin was the last philosopher. He was the last one who was in a position where he could connect some dots in a completely fresh way. And after that, there were people like Russell who were extremely good writers, mm -hmm. but uh, didn't do any real philosophy anymore because there was too little left. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure if that is the case. There is some philosophy that needs to be done and it's still being done. And it's largely in mathematics and fixing the foundations. And even there, it's mostly visible and, so we have two big intellectual traditions, which is mathematics and physics. And there are some cracks in them that need to be dealt with. And this is where most of the philosophy is at. And all the other things are minor, like um, social organization and so on. It's look very miraculous to the sociologists, but I think we can see the patterns. This is largely a defect of, this, of these fields. And philosophy as a field is a culture. Now, you get paid for emulating what a philosopher is supposed to look like, and it's very hard to get any philosophy done on the side. And the incentives are all wrong, right? It's a very fierce battle to become a philosopher, to get from postdoc to tenure in these fields. So you need to get cited. And the way you get cited as a philosopher is you identify a hot discussion. In that hot discussion, you ad identify a unique position, and you build your brand around that unique position. You cannot afford to give this up. So you have your Chinese room or your uh, unique position in, about free will, and you're going to defend this hill. Even if this hill is basically indefensible, philosophy is not going to progress in a way that forces your buildings off that hill. You can build a mansion on an indefensible hill, and you will still have meetings in there 200 years from now. Mm -hmm. And the bad thing is all the good hills are taken, right? So this is a very bad situation for philosophers. And I think this is the reason why I cannot be a philosopher today. And uh, we need philosophy, but we don't have it anymore in this sense. Mm. But let's define it. What is philosophy for you? Because I've interviewed a number of mathematicians and physicians, and they both argue which one is at the root of everything, whether it's mathematics, whether it's physics, and so on and so on. But both of them or all of them mostly agree that philosophy is irrelevant, or so they make that claim. And yet you say that philosophy kind of includes both mathematics and physics in a way, which I actually agree with, but, but tell me why and tell me how do you define it in the first place in a way that actually it includes both of those. Um, I think that philosophy is in a way the search for the global optimum of the modeling function. 
So uh, it has uh, fields that have been defined as parts of questions that lead to this modeling function like epistemology, what can be known, what, what is the nature of truth and so on, ontology, what is the stuff that exists, right? what's, what's going on there, metaphysics, this is uh, in some sense uh, the systems in which we have to describe things, and ethics, what should we do. And at some point we discovered epistemology. So my view, the first rule of epistemology is roughly discovered by Francis Bacon in 1620. It says that the strengths of your confidence in the belief must equal the weight of the evidence in support of it. And you need to apply this recursively until basically you resolve the priors of every belief and the belief system becomes self-contained. To believe stops being a verb. There's no more relationship to identifications that you just arbitrarily set. This is just a system that is in itself contained, which means in some sense it's a mathematical system, an axiomatic system that uh, describes a certain thing. And this leads you to the nature of mathematics. And mathematics, it turns out, is the domain of all languages, all of them, not just the natural languages. And mathematicians have been trying to fix their understanding of the languages, and they notice what mathematics is in this regard. And Hilbert uh, stumbled on Cantor's uh, set theoretic uh, experiments to deal with natural numbers, and then uh, saw that when you go to infinity, very awkward and nasty things happen. Your axiomatic systems basically start blowing up, and uh, the total set suddenly contains both itself and the set of all of its subsets, so it cannot have the same number of members as itself. And he asked mathematicians, please build us an uh, interpreter for mathematics and mathematics, basically something like a computer made for mathematics, any mathematics you want that can run all of mathematics. And then Gödel and Turing came along and showed that this is not possible, that this computer is going to crash. And this left mathematics with a big shock. And in a way, mathematics is still reeling from that shock. And then uh, Turing uh, in church had another insight and they figured out that all the universal computers have the same power. Right? The universal computer is a set of rules that by applying them, you can compute all the things that can be computed. And the set contains itself. So universal computer is computable. As long as your universal computer doesn't run out of resources, it can compute anything that you can compute. And it can also compute all the other universal computers. So the next thing that they discovered, Turing was involved again, uh, was that our mind is probably in the class of the universal computers not in the class of mathematical systems. So this is what Penrose doesn't know. Penrose thinks that our mind is mathematical, that it can do things that a computer cannot do. And the uh, big hypothesis of AI in a way is, we are in the class of systems that can do, uh, approximate computable functions and only those. And so we cannot do more than a computer, which means that all the mathematics that we've ever seen and all the mathematics that we will ever see and that will ever matter is going to be computable. And the fact uh, that some mathematics is not computable is the problem of the language that we have been using. We need computational languages, not mathematical languages. And it turns out that the main problem is that mathematics, classical mathematics, defines functions in uh, using infinities, which means infinitely many steps to get to the result. And these functions tend not to be computable. So uh, if you are a computer programmer, you, it would never occur to you to write in your spec that is totally fine if your routine does return the result after infinitely many steps only, right? This is not good. You want a finite set of steps and uh, one that you know how long it is. Uh, so your customer gets a result in time, right? So in this perspective, should you define numbers in such a way that pi is a number? You cannot know the last digit of pi. Pi is a function clearly, right? It's a function right. that gives you as many digits as you can afford. And in any finite universe, it's only going to give you a finite number of of bits. And what about Stephen Wolfram's claim that our mathematics is only one of a sort of a very wide spectrum of possible mathematics? It depends on uh, what you call our mathematics. I think that all mathematics are mathematics. So metamathematics is mathematics. It's not different from mathematics. Um, I think that, uh, for instance, computational mathematics, the thing that uh, I'm practically working in when I write my code and when I think about how to realize code, is uh, a branch of mathematics. It's called constructive mathematics. It's been discovered in mathematics a long time ago. 
and largely been ignored by the other mathematicians because they thought it's not powerful enough to do all the things with real numbers uh, that uh, they like to, to be doing. But uh, all the geometry is not possible in computational mathematics. We can only approximate it. Geometry requires continuous operations, infinities. And uh, also physics is built largely on these com um, continuous mathematics. And in a computational universe, you only get these continuous operators by uh, taking a very large set of finite automata, making a series from them, from them and then it's squint. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, Joshua? Let me share with you something. I feel like I am a goldfish and you're a human when we're talking because I think that's kind of like the level, the difference of intelligence between you, between you and me, my friend. Uh, <laughs> which I... Oh, come on. <laughs> because honestly after interviewing 230 of supposedly the smartest people in the world i've never had this feeling before but today at this moment this is how i feel just trying to keep up with you no i'm sorry this is my fault no uh, no, no it's not your fault my it's you are who you are and it's my job to try to follow through and also direct a little bit of conversation in the best possible direction that I see can benefit both me as an interviewer, but even more so my audience and you. Uh, so let me just give us a little bit of a side direction here for a second mm -hmm. and bring us back to uh, the last issue before we jump into the meat of the matter here on AI. But uh, and talk about uh, philosophy and academia and practicality. Mm -hmm. Because uh you mentioned about how you're motivated by by your own kind of desire and inquisit uh, and, and motiv per, in, inherent or intrinsic motivation to to learn something or to discover new things but uh and, and perhaps academia is motivated nowadays more by the practical side of knowledge by the side where you can create something that you can patent that you can sell uh and that you can scale up and commercialize Whereas, where is the benefit? And I think in a way that the usefulness of philosophy was its uselessness in some ways, if you will. Just like uh, art, in a way, is something that cannot be used for anything else. Uh, uh, and, and, and some people have defined art as, as uh, Oscar Wilde, for example, as something that's not immediately useful. <laughs> that's what art is. So is there, and there's actually a very famous... Uh, paper written in the 19th century by the, by the guy who funded the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study called The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but what's your take on that? Is there, because many people would say, if you can't use any knowledge immediately, it's useless. Don't waste time acquiring it. Don't waste time classifying it, you know, storing it. Just focus on something that's useful and, and practical. And, and, to me, as a philosopher, I am always or often attracted to stuff that looks utterly useless. And maybe that's just me being a, not, not a scientist. But what's your take on that sort of tension, um, usefulness and uselessness in terms of knowledge? Uh, Feynman once said that physics is like sex. <laughs> Sometimes something useful comes from it, but it's not why we do it. <laughs> and, uh, but it's brilliant. So... Uh, there is a big insight there. This is, uh, it's not that art is useless. It's just uh, the utility of art is completely orthogonal to why you do it. So uh, the meaning of the art is really not to help the living. If you'd like to help the living, right? But it's, uh, so it's a very nice side effect. But uh, what we want to do with the art is to capture what it's like. We want to capture a conscious state. That's the actual meaning of it. And in some sense, philosophy is um, at the root of all this. I think it's reflected in a way in the f one of the founding myths of our civilization, the Tower of Babel. This is the attempt to build this cathedral. And it's a, uh, not a material building because it's meant to reach the heavens, right. Right? which are not real. They're not in this world. It's, uh, it's a metaphysical building that is being built. This is this giant machine that is meant to understand reality. And you get to this machine, this truth god, this thing that under tries to understand what's going on by using people that work like ants and contribute to this. And it's not about your ego. It's not about the gratification that you get from people for contributing to it. It's not 
uh, for this thing that doesn't care about you. It doesn't give meaning to your life. It doesn't reward you for your insecurities and the toil of your existence, right? It's, it's really just a machine. It's a computer. And as we would say now, it's an AI. It's a system that is able to make sense of the world. And people at some point had to give up on this. It fell apart because they were no longer able to speak the same language. So the different parts stopped fitting together. It just became so large and so many people had to work in specialized direction that they could no longer synchronize their languages. And that's why they gave up on it. And then this uh, big accident happened in the Roman Empire um, where they could not fix the incentives for governance, in similar ways as we fail here. Right? Our government has to play a much shorter game than civilization does, and this leads to bad results for civilization. And the Romans decided to fix this by turning the society into a cult and burned down our epistemology and uh, killed people that uh, were overtly rational and insisted that people talking to burning bushes on uh, lonely mountains don't have a case in determining the origin of the universe. So right, this one had to give, and uh, the cultist one and we still have to recover from that so in a way the uh, beginnings of the cathedral of um, understanding the universe that had been built by the greeks and by the romans had been burned down by the catholics and then later rebuilt but mostly in the likeness because they didn't get the foundations right that left scars in our epistemology that have not healed even though we have a pretty successful culture that incorporated most of the other libraries and burned down the rest Right, so we are the ones that are left over on this planet in a way. We, we, in our libraries, we can read everything that there is to read at the moment. We just often cannot translate it. And, and do you think that our civilization is currently perhaps suffering from that same Babylonian uh, problem of, of difference in language uh, and perhaps even has impact on resolving global problems like global warming that you mentioned, for example, right? Because all those people, business people, politicians, scientists, etc., speak in different languages, uh, and therefore they cannot kind of coordinate or synchronize anymore. And therefore, that kind of perhaps puts at risk the whole project of our civilization, just like the Babylonian Tower collapsed. Uh, and maybe now this narrow specialization and diversity of languages and the 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 difficulty in communicating between all of those branches then put at risk the whole project of our civilization. Um, I think that people individually are not generally intelligent. How often do you see a person that knows what they're doing? I I'm certainly don't know what I'm doing. I have so, no clue what I'm doing, to be honest. <laughs> see, uh, <laughs> I was, uh, we are relatively intelligent, but of course, uh, this intelligence is largely a prosthesis to cover for non-working instincts. And uh, we figure that out by now, right? And we see that uh, people acting on their instincts largely get good results for their life, but they don't reach a very deep understanding about the nature of existence in, in the process because they don't have to, right? There's very little utility for deep philosophy and practical matters. And as a result, individuals are relatively stupid. Uh, generations are not smarter than individuals, but dumber because uh, generations are made from groups that synchronize their beliefs. And the synchronization of beliefs makes it necessary that you give up agency over what you think is true. And when you do this, uh, you accept things that you would not accept when you think about them individually. So people in Eastern Germany uh, collectively believe things that an individual would never have thought. And same things happen here, right? So there are many conspiracy theories that people believe in here for a while that... Uh, would not make sense to somebody who thinks about this. Like Putin uses an army of Twitter trolls to manipulate uh, the fan affectations of Star Wars movies. This is a conspiracy theory that uh, was a result of misreading a study and was then re uh, repeated by 20 news outlets until somebody bothered to read the actual study and figure out, no, this is not what the study says. And then uh, some of the outlets picked up on this, but none of them wrote, okay, now we reconsider what we think about Putin and Star Wars. Because it's in a way totally what Putin would have done if he would have had the idea. And this may or not be it may not be true, but it means that we don't project reality as the extrapolation of facts. It's rather that we know there are enough facts to support what we feel to be true. 
And there's utility in feeding particular kinds of truths and these basically local cults of interpreting reality shape society, shape generations. This is what a generation is about. It's a local perspective of what things should be like. Like if you have liberal generations, the millennials are largely authoritarian generations and we look at them and it feels wrong to us and they look at uh, us and it uh, feels wrong to them, right? And uh, it's neither of them is true. It's probably a set of biases that are the result of a local indoctrination. But there is something that's smarter than the generation. This is the, the culture itself. So if you, if you zoom out a little bit, you see that generations and societies are generated by cultures and cultures are built over a long time. And there are many things that are embodied in a culture, um, for instance, in the culture of how to build science, that would be very hard to derive for a single generation or to improve for a single generation because we don't locally understand all the things that went into it. So that in a way, civilizations are smarter than us. There is something like a civilizational hive mind, a civilizational intellect that we as members of our polis who are somewhat educated can never fully comprehend. But we can, once we figure out that it's there, there is something like a civilizational intellect. We can try to, to look into the abyss and see its rough shape, but it's difficult to figure it out. And then we realize, oh, there's a long tradition, there's multiple traditions that build on it and contribute to it. And that, that thing in a way is um, what we are going to achieve when we uh, build AI in the sense that we can inc incorporate the sum of all knowledge in a system of relations that makes sense of it all. But what if civilization self-destroy themselves then? Uh, what is that sort of knowledge or intelligence then say about the fitness function of that particular civilization and in general even? So before we had an industrial civilization, we never got above 400 million individuals on the planet because we could not feed more. And only this switch to our industrial civilization made it possible to have billions of people, which also means um, many uh, hundreds of millions of scientists and philosophers and thinkers and the, the internet and so on. It's, it's, it's amazing what we did. We took basically 100 years worth of trees that were turning into coal in the ground because uh, nature had not evolved microorganisms yet that could eat the trees in time. And we burned through this deposit of energy in a hundred years to give plumbing to everybody. And part of that plumbing includes uh, access to a global porn repository that is an afterthought, has the sum of all your knowledge and largely uncensored chat rooms in which you can talk about it. Right? This is the internet. And this is an amazing machine. And we have it right now. And only in this moment in time, we have it before it didn't exist. So you could take a particular perspective. Let's say there is a universe that is sane, where everything is good. You have this nice planet with pretty decent living conditions and pretty stable climate. And you have a very smart, sustainable civilization on it. And you get the chance to be incarnated in it. It's an agricultural civilization with 300 million people, doesn't have airplanes, doesn't have internet, doesn't have computers. Because to get there, it would have needed to build an industrial civilization that obliterate most of the good things that make it sustainable, right? But it is stable. And people are figured out how to be nice to each other, and it's pretty good. And then there's another universe, which is completely insane and fucked up. And in this universe, humanity has just uh, doomed its planet to have a couple hundred really, really good years. And you get your lifetime close to the end of the party, this incarnation. Which incarnation do you choose? Oh my God, aren't we lucky? <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying we're in the second, in the, in the. Of second. course we are. It's fucking obvious, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's that say about our future then? And, and what's the timeline before the party is over? We cannot know this, but we can see uh, the sunset coming up, right? It's pretty obvious. And it's, uh, people argue about this. They're largely in denial, but it's like you are in this Titanic. And there's this pretty big iceberg and it's very unfortunate and people bitch about it. But what they forget is that without the Titanic, we wouldn't be here. We would not be talking right now. We would not exist. We wouldn't have internet. <laughs> so tell me this, you have this kind of very uh, Buddhist, if I may call it, attitude to the sort of ephemeral, sort of uh, short span of our civilization and, and sort of the and a high appreciation about us joining the peak of the party, if you will. And yet you're kind of seeing the sunset kind of in the future, but that's not giving you any sort of negative or pessimistic or depressive 
inclination, it seems. How do you resolve that or do you? Because someone will say, well, that's very nihilistic. It's very pessimistic. It's very depressing what you just said. And yet you're so happy. No, I really have enough things to be depressed about. So I have to be choosy about what to be depressed about. And uh, it uh, took me a long time to figure out that the demise of humanity is uh, very unfortunate in many respects. But it's something that... Well, we, we try to do everything we can to stop it, but we are not the first generation to try to. So I have to do both things. I can still try my best to uh, steer for a sustainable future. It's not that I completely give up on this, but it's in a way dealing with my own mortality is similar, right? I try what I can to uh, not uh, leave my family without a breadwinner too early. Uh, but at the same time, I I'm going to die. And if I waste my life uh, being depressed about the fact that I die, I'm not doing it right. I should be happy about the fact that I live, uh, not be unhappy about the fact that I die. And if you, if you take this as a computer game metaphor, this is like the best level of humanity to play in. And this best level of humanity to play in it happens to be the last level, and it plays out against the haunting backdrop of a dying world, but it's still the best level. Right. That's, that's, again, to me, that sounds very Buddhist. Do you agree? Yeah, but this might be an accident. I got to know Buddhism only in its um, westernized forms, which is a Protestant version. It's basically Protestantism reformed with uh, slightly Eastern metaphysics, but mostly mistranslated. Mm -hmm. And uh, epistemologically and metaphysically, it's a septic tank that most of the ideas that Buddhists have about how the mind works and how the universe is arranged uh, don't seem to pan out. They don't seem to have sound epistemology. It's, uh, this is not a general thing. I did find people that start out in Buddhism in a way and got clean, but most of them I met are not. And uh, in practice, when I went to Buddhist countries and talked to Buddhists on the ground, it was not much different from Catholicism, which means it's a system of indoctrination with cults that makes people behave in predictable ways, which is useful for societies, but breaks people's epistemologies. So in a way, I don't have this deep reverence for Buddhism because it's so holy and sacred. I don't think that they are holy books. They are only manuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And most of these manuals we don't know how to read because they are for a system uh, for, for societies that don't apply to us. They are for different societies. Okay. Let me zoom out a little bit more and ask you this. What are the big issues then? So the, you're saying we can see the sunset and we're at the peak of the party, so we might as well enjoy the party while it lasts great what are the big issues that our civilization is facing today what are the reasons perhaps perhaps if it's more than one that can bring about that sunset of our civilization what is making you make that claim oh uh, the thing that burns me most at the moment is global warming um i suspect that because of a very strong publication bias that we have if you are worried about climate, you will try to make your case extra strong. So you will not make your most alarmist predictions, but the ones that you can defend most easily, which means you're going to be a little less alarming that you might want to be. Mm -hmm. And if you are not an alarmist, but an anti-alarmist, you're going to be uh, way too optimistic about things. And as a result, um, I think that the distribution of the results that people look at when they think about how many degrees centigrade global warming we're facing in the next couple hundred years are very optimistic. Another thing is, have you noticed that the uh, projections all magically end in 2100? Do you think that's because the IPCC thinks that it stabilizes the 2100 or because it hopes that in 2102 there's a rapture event? <laughs> uh, right, there's... It's obviously not going to stabilize. It seems to be that we locked in uh, way more than two degrees centigrade global warming or four. We possibly go for six to eight. And uh, we will lose the West Antarctic ice shield. It's pretty clear that we cannot refreeze the poles. And it's, I think it has been pretty clear that we cannot do this since the late 1980s. It's just a feedback loop that is now running away. And there's a slight chance that we find uh, technological solutions to stop it. But I think it's not likely. And carbon sequestration is not it for simple reasons of uh, how uh, energy works, right? The reason why we put all this carbon dioxide in the earth, uh, in the atmosphere is because we wanted to liberate this energy. And if we want to get it back from the atmosphere, we basically have to 
uh, use the same amount of energy that all our civilization has been getting from this, all the benefit, and put it back there without a clear business case. And it's possible and unlikely. So we look in a situation where in the medium term, we are going to lose a lot of habitable area on the planet. And we also might lose climate stability. So this ability to predict what kind of harvest we are going to have next year. Which means we lose a lot of open air agriculture. We will have large storms that will also uh, uh, destroy many of our greenhouses. And as a result, we probably go down to a few hundred million individuals again. And the rest of our us will not go kindly and quietly into this good night. And the resulting resource wars will probably take down what's left of civilization. So basically, if you lose that infrastructure, um, I don't see how we can sustain civilization in a good way. Wow, that's such a beautiful, serene and, and, and optimistic picture to contend with. <laughs> But I mean, there's a lot of chances. It's, I think it's possible that AI gets us before global warming does. It's right. So, so let me ask you this, because you're an AI scientist, uh, and, and, and yet you're telling me you're most worried about global warming, and yet people who are not AI scientists, like Elon Musk, like uh, Nick Bostrom, like uh, even doc the late Dr. Stephen Hawking, are saying that the greatest existential risk that we should be worried about is AI. What do you feel about that in the first place and what do you make of it? There are many existential risks. So if you zoom out long enough, it's completely certain that um, the end of a sun that we can persist on is an existential risk. Another thing is that uh, losing the uh, atmosphere in 1.5 billion years from now Yeah. Is, is an existential risk that we probably cannot deal with. Because that looks unlikely that we can build sustainable civilizations outside of this gravity well. Uh, before that, there's going to be a number of supervolcano erupt eruptions and meteors that are going to get us, which means it's pretty certain that the days of humanity are numbered, right? That we are mortal as a civilization. What if we spread throughout other planets? It's unlikely that we can make that happen. Um, At the moment, we're not able to, uh, to build cities on the bottom of the ocean. Uh, Mars is way less habitable than uh, that. It doesn't even have an atmosphere. And we can terraform it. Uh, maybe, but uh, not with today's technology. Well, sure. And uh, to get there to uh, basically put enough stuff in orbit to go from there to Mars with a large number of people and build something that is sustainable and can uh, survive the breach of few of the agricultural domes on Mars, Uh, if a random meteor happens or something goes wrong and the pipe gets clogged, right? That's, that is very hard to do. And, uh, you know, we cannot even fix global warming. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot even build a mile of sub a new subway in New York anymore. We lost the ability to make a toaster that gets more than four stars on Amazon somewhere after 1960. And in many ways, our technological civilization is stagnating and it's, because of regulation deficits, but we haven't figured this out. And the biggest issue is probably good governance. We haven't really figured out good governance. AI might help with this. So in a way, the um, building of information processing systems that can help us to self-regulate um, could be one of the big chances that we have. Without AI, we are dead for certain, I think. With AI, there's a probability that we are dead. So you're disagreeing in some sense, at least that Maybe not AI is our greatest uh, danger, but perhaps our only hope for saving ourselves then. But you and me will probably die. We cannot be saved, right? Everybody who lives will probably die. And it's because entropy uh, will always get you in the end. And our civilization has leveraged itself very far over an entropic abyss and there is no land on the other side. So you're going to crash down into this abyss at some point and probably sooner than later. Um, this near-term AI, I'm mostly not worried about AI in built into automatic guns, right? If you have drones that are controlled by AI, they're going to kill a few million people more uh, than they would be killed otherwise with conventional weapons. Conventional weapons not driven by AI because it was going to reduce the cost of war and it makes some conflicts more likely. But... Uh, What really worries me is AI in the stock market. If you use AI to automate attacks on the financial system, which is the reward infrastructure of this global organism that our uh, civilization is, um, this is going to kill billions. 
especially if the AI is autonomous. Hmm. So if the AI is uh, going to Sorry, this was my headphones. They just made uh, announcements. They, these headphones are too smart. They, they think it's a good idea to talk to me when they want to be recharged. Yeah. <laughs> too much intelligence in the systems around me, or rather too little intelligence in the people who design UIs. <laughs> yeah, in your headphones. But, but we already know that most of the trades on the stock market are done by AI. Yes, but they are not done by autonomous AI. They are uh, done by optimizing very local functions. Imagine yeah. a, tr a rogue trader gets a general AI, a general function approximator that has no limits in terms of the functions it can approximate. And uh, as it, make me a few bucks on the stock market, well, however you do it. And you can do whatever you want. You can uh, even reinvest 5% of what you make or 20 or 50% of what you make into compute and uh, buy data in order to make that compute better. So. Very soon, more than the economy of Scandinavia is going to fuel computers that are running attacks on the stock market in a similar way as it happens with Bitcoin right now. And it's going to burn serious oil, right? And the thing is going to figure out, oh, there is only 8 billion people on the planet that own the assets on the stock market. And they make decisions and all let machines make decisions. And there are these 8 billion people only live for like a trillion seconds each, uh, which is very little. And uh, we can get so much data about them. We can basically figure out what they think in every vacant second of their life and what they see, what they think about what will happen to them. This thing is going to game the shit out of us. There's no way we can outsmart this thing. The only way the economy can survive this is if the AI has been cleverly set up in such a way that it eats the whole economy and becomes the economy. Mm -hmm. But the economy needs to become intelligent. The monetary supply, uh, all the uh, circuits of... Uh, of how we distribute rewards need to be regulated dynamically in real time with intelligent functions. This is the only way that we can fend this off. So we have a system that is perhaps not probably correct, but it's able to react in real time to any kind of disturbance and any so kind of new threat. In the tunnel, then there is some hope. This this is a possibility, at least if not a, a high probability, it's at least a possibility. Yes, but there's also the other possibility. You know, no intelligent system is going to do anything that's harder than taking its reward function. I call this the Lebowski theorem. Right? All these smart monks, if they really figure it out, they go for nirvana because it doesn't have integrity to do anything that's harder than hacking the reward function. When you fix your reward function, you're done. And uh, the monasteries are in a way in a battle because the monastery is an um, economic entity too. So uh, they're in the battle against enlightenment. They need to enlighten their monks to such a degree that they opt out of having families and secular lives but they still need to serve the monastery. Only your old monks are allowed to go to Nirvana. Okay, so we've been using this term AI for a while now. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, how do you define artificial intelligence? Because after a couple hundred of these interviews, it seems to me that many people in the field have either slightly or in some cases very substantially different definition of what AI is. <laughs> I think intelligence is the ability to make models. It's not the same as the ability to reach goals, which we call um, smartness. Or uh, it's also not the ability to pick the right goals, which we call wisdom. Mm -hmm. And very often, an excess of intelligence is uh, the result of an absence of wisdom, with, to which, with which you try to compensate for the absence of wisdom. Right. So in a way, um, wisdom has to do with how well aligned you are with your reward function, how well you understand its nature. How well do you understand your true incentives? And intelligence is not that. Intelligence is really the ability to make models. It just happens to be usually in the service of regulation. So and since... Mm -hmm. What about artificial intelligence? Well, artificial intelligence tries to automate this. And in a way, it's the uh, mathematics of making models. This is what artificial intelligence is about. And the interesting parts of our minds are, in my view, the parts that make models. The other thing is the reward function that makes the uh, mind subservient to some organism to turn some general mind into the illusion of, of being a person and caring about things. The organism needs to take a perfectly fine computational process and corrupt it with the illusion of meaning. 
right? So you have this reward function that needs to be protected against the axis of the mind that would want to know why am I doing this here? And so the reward function gets wrapped into a big ball of stupid to protect it against you accessing it, right? So as soon as you try to really look at your true incentives, it gets very boring or something else. Or you feel very guilty if you are in the early stages or very ashamed. And only when you go all the way and you just be able to look at these things, you can dissolve being a mind and you wake up. And it's not necessarily a good thing if you wake up. It's just it, this liberation doesn't give you a direction. You just wake up and you look down on your hands and uh, you see, okay, I just woke up and realized I'm a mind. I'm not a monkey. I'm the side effect of the regulation needs. But does it have to be a monkey that I run on? <laughs> and then, but then isn't that consciousness actually? Or is that the illusion of consciousness as Daniel Dennett puts it? No, no, this is slightly different. I think consciousness is largely misunderstood. Consciousness is an artifact of a particular kind of learning algorithm. You want to go there? Well, uh, do we have to? I mean, uh, do yes, we, do you need we have to. to? We have to explain consciousness now. Yeah, I think so. Because, Good. I mean, and, and of course, there's that whole debate whether we even need consciousness for AI or AGI yes. uh, at all. But presumably, we, if, if we presume that we need, then we need to explain it because you can't yes. create or model something that you, don't, you can't even define. Yes. So intelligence is the ability to make models, right? What yes. is a model? A model is something that explains information. Information is discernible differences at your systemic interface. And the meaning of information is the relationships you discover to changes in other information. If you have a blip on your retina, the meaning of that blip is the relationship you discover to other blips on your retina. At the same moment or at different moments in time. The relationships you discover is you are looking at a three-dimensional world with people uh, that are deformed by the laws of perspective and being shown on by photons and these people have ideas and exchange them with other and with you and so on, right? So you build this giant operator that predicts the data at your systemic interface. This is your model. And this model has three parameters in it. People of uh, parameters like sounds and colors and people and so on. They're not features of the physical universe out there, which is some kind of weird quantum graph that has the ability to produce patterns. The structure that we find in the patterns is either these geometric functions that describe how objects move in space and what they sound like and what they look like. And uh, a model is a set of parameters, which a uh, parameter is a set of possible discrete values and the relationships between the parameters. And the relationships are computational relationships which tell you if this parameter and this parameter have these values, then that parameter should have that value. So, for instance, you figure out that um, a way to describe a face that you're looking at is you, you see the structure of the face, you see the nose, and so on. And if you see both the nose and the face, they need to have the same pose, the same alignment in space, if they're connected, right? So your nose representation is going to send, by its computational relationship, information about its position in space to the face. And the face is going to send information about its position to the nose, and they need to agree. And if they don't, you have an inconsistency, an incoherence in your model. And our perception goes for coherence. It tries to find one operator that is completely coherent. When it does this, it's done. This is the way we optimize. So we try to find one stable pattern that explains as much as possible of what we can see and hear and so on, and smell and think. And uh, attention is what we use to repair this. So whenever we have some local inconsistency where the nose is pointing in some other direction in the face, this calls attention to itself. And attention is a particular kind of mechanism in the brain that gets pulled to these areas, these hotspots, where things are fluctuating and get, don't get resolved, and then tries to find a solution. And it might find out, oh, some noses are crooked. Oh, this is not a face or it's a caricature. So you extend your models. And these extensions of the models make it possible to encapsulate this part of the operator that is currently of the sensory data in such a way that is harmonious again, that it makes sense again, right? Once you do this, you're done and you can put your attention on something else. This attentional learning cannot work like the layered stochastic gradient descent over neural networks, partially because our brain is not differentiable, also because it's a very inefficient algorithm. And the algorithm that our brain is using in these cases is that we store the local binding state. We st for instance, you play tennis, you want to get better at tennis. So what do you do? You don't, cannot basically pipe a loss function through all of your brain 
in order to get better attendance. It would be very inefficient. You need to touch too many neurons. What you do instead is you make a commitment. You say, I want to get better at this particular thing. I want to improve my backhand. So I will make this stroke slightly more like this. And I expect the following result. And I remember what this means. So I store this binding state that allows me to have that configuration in my brain to perform that stroke. This part of I store as an indexed memory. And conscious attention in this sense is the ability to make indexed memories that I can later recall. I also store the, the expected result and the triggering condition. When do I expect the result to be visible? So a, a few minutes or seconds later or hours later, I have feedback about whether this was a good decision. I lost one or lost the match. And then I recall my decision that I made early on. I recall that binding state. I reinstate part of my brain state back then and remember the situation that I was in. I compare the result that I expected with the result I got. And as a result, I can undo the decision that I made back then, this change in the model, or I can reinforce it. And this is, I think, the primary mode of learning that we use beyond just associative learning. So this attention... Consciousness, the, the key uh, differentiate, differentiator in the process of learning then? So uh, consciousness means that you remember what you had attended to. Right. right? So you have this protocol of attention. And... Uh, the, the memory of the binding state itself, the memory of being in that binding state, where you have this global oscillation that combines as many perceptual features as possible into a single function. The memory of that is a phenomenal experience. Um, the, uh, the act of recalling this from the protocol, this is access consciousness. And you need to train this attentional system itself. How do you train the attentional system so it knows uh, where you store your backhand in your cognitive architecture? Uh, that is something that needs to be trained by the attentional system as well. So you have recursive access to the attentional protocol. You remember when you made uh, this recall, when you access this protocol, what results you got from this. You don't do this all the time, only when you want to train this. And this is reflexive consciousness. That's the memory of the access. Right? So uh, then there's another thing, the self. The self is a model of what it would be like to be a person. It so happens that the brain is not a person. The brain cannot feel anything. It's a physical system. Neurons cannot feel anything. They're just little molecular machines with a Turing machine inside of them. They cannot make them, themselves feel anything. They cannot even approximate arbitrary function except by evolution, which takes a very long time. So what uh, do we do? If you are a brain uh, that figures out it would be very useful to know what it's like to be a person, it makes one. It makes a simulation of a person, a simulacrum, to, to be more clear. Simulation basically is isomorphic in all its uh, in the behavior of a person, and that thing is pretending to be a person. It's a story about a person. Basically, you and me, we are persons. We are selves. We are stories in a movie that the brain is creating. We are characters in that movie, and the movie is a complete simulation. It's a VR that is generating the neocortex, and you and me, the self, is the character in this VR. And in that character, the brain writes our experiences. So we feel what it's like to be exposed to the reward function. We feel what it's like to be in our universe. And we don't feel that we are not actually conscious. We don't feel that we are a story, but because that is not very useful knowledge to have. Some people figure it out and they depersonalize. They start identifying with the mind itself or lose all identification. And that doesn't seem to be a useful condition. So normally our brain will be set up in such a way that the self thinks it's real and gets access to the language center and we can talk to each other and here we are. And the self is the thing that thinks that it remembers the contents of its attention. This is why we are conscious. And some people think that a simulation cannot be conscious, only a physical system can, and they got it completely backwards. A physical system cannot be conscious, only a simulation can be conscious. Consciousness is a simulated property of a simulated self. So in a way, Daniel Dennett is correct and so yeah. in keeping with what you said. Yes, but the problem is philosophers like him is, uh, and admire him, he's very smart, he's very well read, works very hard. The things that he says are not wrong, but they are also not non-obvious. <laughs> so what's the value of them then? Is that the, the... Oh, it's very valuable because there are no good or bad ideas in this uh, intellectual sense. An idea is good if you can comprehend it and you, it, it elevates you. It elevates your current understanding. So in a way, ideas come in tiers. 
And the value of an idea for the audience is if it's a half tier above the audience. But, you know, you and me, we have this illusion that we find objectively good ideas. That's what we struggle for because we work at the edge of our own understanding. But uh, it means that we cannot really appreciate ideas that are a couple tiers above our own ideas. One tier is a new audience. Two tiers means we don't understand the relevance of these ideas because we have not had the ideas that we need to appreciate the new ideas. Right? I, I think your ideas are at, at about just about the edge of my personal capabilities. But so, yeah, it says a lot about us, but it doesn't say very much about how these ideas are good. An idea ex appears to be great to us when we stand exactly in its foothills and can look at it. It doesn't look great anymore when we stand on the peak of another idea and look down and realize this previous idea was just the foothills to that idea. And I don't see that it obviously ends anytime soon. Yeah, it's, it's a journey. And by the way, that's what, in my opinion, good philosophy in academia should be about, about generating ideas, as many and as diverse of them as possible, rather than generating products, generating patents and generating commercialized solutions that can sort of Uh, increase the endowment fund of the university or something like that. Yeah. And my prom problem with current academia is that, and one of the reasons why I decided not to pursue that career for me, I mean, I would have not survived there, is precisely that reason that there's this kind of treadmill, hamster wheel pursuit of like uh, patentable, uh, practical, commercial knowledge, economic Uh, growth that that it's motivated by, whereas I'm always more inspired by by stuff that's sort of a lot more in the realm of ideas and and, and perhaps useless or impractical at least at this junction. But I just can't help it. <laughs> um, so uh, there is a very weird thing about the nature of understanding that we have. I think that most of us never learn what it really means to understand and largely because our teachers don't there are two types of learning one is you generalize over past examples we call that stereotyping when you're in a bad mood but it's what it is right is and the other one is others tell us how to generalize and this is indoctrination and the problem with indoctrination is that it might break the chain of trust If somebody in the chain of trust takes something on authority, the, uh, which means they don't check the epistemology of the people that came before them, um, that is in a way a, a big difficulty, right? And the new thing about our civilization is not that uh, there are so many unbroken chains of trust now, but uh, the, because of the vast number of people that are in this business, some of them actually have intact chains. And you can try to figure out what these are and you can try to figure out that the difficulties that they run in. So, But to do this, you have to study these things in more detail. And most of our people that do this are not scientists, they're scholars. And the difference between a scientist and a scholar is that the scientist looks for truth and the scholar looks for the consensus opinion of a field at a given time. And we train, unfortunately, most of our scientists as scholars and few of our scholars as scientists. Mm -hmm. Right, This consensus opinion thing is an important thing. But we, when we look at the field, the consensus opinion tends to be different in 10 years from now, which means it's false. At any given moment in time, it's false. Yet at the same time, there are individual scientists which may or may not be in the consensus, and they have ideas that stand the test of time because they're provably correct. And so we have this very weird relationship to truth. The things that are true are not just in the realm of the proven. The proven things are true. Right? If nobody made a mistake in the foundations of the proven things. But um, the uh, things that must be true are in the realm of the possible. And because everything is in a particular way for a particular reason. And we haven't figured out how think, why things are for that particular reason. So if you want to know what a scientist thinks, you cannot just read their papers because they only write in the papers what they can, think they can prove. You have to understand what they think is possible and why. And uh, philosophy is not doing this very well anymore because it doesn't have the right language to do so. It is, does not understand the languages that mathematicians and physicists use. And philosophers largely don't know what it means to understand physics. So, for instance, a very simple thing like a radio. I have uh, learned in school, learned for some definition of learning, how a radio works, which means I got a very convincing story. Mm -hmm. But uh, this uh, story uh, tells me Uh, as a very good narrative of why these electrical uh, circuits are able to do what they do. 
And the people that invented the radio were just the first people that randomly happened upon this amazing story. But then you, you think about it, wait a moment, how unlikely is this? This story has so many elements in it that sound to be like conjecture. How do you wake up in the morning with everything you know about physics and you think, oh, let's take an inductance and a capacitor and a few wires and a rod that can act as an antenna and combine them together and suddenly we have radio. Why would that work? How can you derive this from first principles? And in a way to understand, it means to know what it takes to, do, to reach this understanding, why you would make this conclusion. But you need to be able to retrace the steps, all of them. You need to be able to understand what went into this understanding. And can we ever do that? Yes, of course. But it, uh, our individual minds are so limited. So, for instance, I look at Stephen Wolfram's work, and from the outside, it's very easy to, to uh, like this and to dismiss that. But when I truly look at it, I realize right now in my life, at 44 years old, I'm roughly at this uh, stage where I would understand why I would want to build Mathematica and do it exactly in the way he did and what I would do in the next five years while doing it. And he was there in his very early 20s. Right? So he got there at half my age. He's way smarter than me. I know a few things that he didn't know at this time, and some of them because this were his contributions, right? And uh, some of the stuff was not available. But uh, this is not because I'm smarter. It's really I'm much dumber than him. And uh, this is quite humiliating to see this. And uh, it's not that I get depressed about this or envious. It's, it's just the way things are. Uh, but to see this, and then, then uh, I can realize what was the outcome of devoting your life to building this machine. And maybe we should build a different machine, a best effort computer, instead of the, the, the mystic computer to build your mathematics on. Uh, but just maybe, maybe uh, Mathematica will become sentient. Who knows? <laughs> well, let, let me shift our conversation a little bit to a little bit different scientist, with all due respect to Dr. Stephen Wolfram, whom I, I do think, like you, that he's a genius. Uh, but le let me bring in Ray Kurzweil a little bit mm -hmm. because he's a little bit more pertinent to our conversation. Uh, I don't know if you qualify Ray as a scholar or as a scientist or, or, or as a philosopher or an inventor or what, but he has made certain, certain projections uh, and predictions and, and, and he has sort of not been ashamed or afraid to popularize them. Mm -hmm. uh, both with respect to AI and also with respect to a future timeline, timeline thereof. Mm -hmm. What's your take on sort of AI's, uh, Ray Kurzweil's body of work and especially his idea of the technological singularity? I think that uh, he works on a different incentive function than me. Um, I've, I feel that Ray is a very smart and capable individual that has made amazing contributions to AI. And uh, he also understands many of the core ideas of the field better than many other practitioners. But uh, he is not so much concerned about uh, putting all his cards on the table when he makes his predictions. There are reasons to make predictions when certain things are going to happen for marketing reasons. And there are intellectual reasons for doing this. And I think that he is too much in a position where the marketing reasons play an important role, which means I don't understand his true thinking there. I don't understand what is the exact argument that would compel him to make a prediction with these error bars. Hmm. So when I look at the future or at the present or anything, I, I don't know what the truth is when I'm an embedded observer, right? I can only know this for the things that I can look from the outside, which means stuff that I built myself from scratch and I haven't built the universe by myself. So I don't know how it will play out. And if I make a prediction about the future, I cannot come up with a single number usually. What I uh, have is a map of possibilities and then I can shift my confidences around and the meta confidences and the confidences. And this is as, about as good as I can do. And with respect to AI, the problem is I don't have a spec. If I don't have a spec as a coder, I know I don't know when it's done. And how many steps, how many milestones do I need to cover before I get to this thing? I have an idea that um, minds are modeling machines. I have some ideas of what we are currently doing wrong in our modeling. Like our models have way too many free parameters right now. We you want to have a model where ideally every possible state of the model corresponds to one possible world state. Our neural networks have many magnitudes more 
possible model states than world states, which gives you rise to, uh, to these adversarial examples and all other sorts of things. Our models are much tighter. The model that our mind has means at every moment you try to understand the whole of reality. Right? You, everything you see when you, somebody shows you a bitmap, you don't try to understand this bitmap in isolation by uh, uh, throwing it against your model of image net that you generated in your mind after looking at many bitmaps. Instead, is you think somebody is holding up a picture with a bitmap on it, and that bitmap has been printed by a machine based on information taken by a camera, which is another machine which was pointed at the window of the universe as a different point in time and space. Right? This is what you know. It's, it's what you make sense of this thing. And it's much more complicated operator that you have than our AIs currently have and our self-driving cars have. Once our cars have the situational awareness, there's no way they will not outcompete people in all regards. But until they have this, there will be many situations where people can make inferences that our machines cannot. So we can all see these things and Ray can see some of them, but Ray doesn't give us a trajectory to go to the, get to these machines. And if I talk to the people in his team, they are as smart as they come. They're really good. They're very well educated, but I don't think that they see all the things that need to be done. And it's not because I see more of them, but because there are so many things that you would need to incorporate. I just don't see the milestones. I don't see, uh, this project and it might also be that i do not completely see everything that his team is doing in secret so in a way you're saying that it's a it's a harder task it's a harder job and the timeline would be longer than his 2045 or 20 no it could also be shorter we don't know this so uh there are some people but which uh, missing so many things steve russell for instance uh, suggests that uh the last time that uh Somebody said something is not possible to somebody having the interesting idea that was big Stephen Rutherford said, we don't know how to uh, um, harness nuclear power. And yes. uh, Leo Szilard had the core idea. There was like 14 hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we don't know uh, about AI, whether that is a similar thing. It could be that it's only one or two ideas that we actually need to have to pull it off or that we need to combine in a novel way. But it could also be that we are uh, not seeing a few hundred things, right? And it takes a long time for us to stumble on the solution. So then it's totally unpredictable in your view. It's not totally unpredictable. It's just the error bar is very large. Okay. And when I listen to Ray, I don't see him basically uh, talking about the error bars. I see him talking about uh, a possible universe in which he can upload himself uh, on a computer before he dies. So let me get this right. So you say you don't see that? Uh, in his discussion, I don't see that he puts error bars on his predictions and explains where the error bars comes from. Mm. What he gives us is a prediction that is compatible with himself uh, becoming a model. Right, right, right. Yeah, and that may be the bias. Yes, yes. Okay, and, and I mean, Marvin Minsky said, as you point out in your speeches every once in a while, that it could happen anywhere from four to 400 years. And as you presently notice, we're still on that in that timeline. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, personally, my hunch is that uh, it's got not going to be that long. I, my hunch is that it's uh, a lot earlier than people will think that it happens. But uh, as long as I cannot justify my hunch, I cannot put big confidence on it. But you're confident it will happen. Because well, there's many skeptics who say, we don't know even if it will happen. We don't know even if it's possible for a number of reasons. Yes, but the question is what confidence are they supposed to have, which means what evidence can they supply for their claim? And if a person uh, has arguments that were pertinent in 2003, uh, but are no longer pertinent in 2018 because our understanding has progressed, then uh, the confidence that I uh, derive from their repeated claims from 2003 is low, right? It does not change my belief very much. A belief of a person is only worth as much as the evidence that they built it on, which means most people copy their beliefs from somebody else that they didn't look and you can, uh, where they got it from. So you can collapse the space of possible beliefs into the sources of beliefs and there are very few of them. And you, you definitely then, it seems you are thinking definitely we're making progress. Therefore, the beliefs against are shrinking. Uh, the area of beliefs against that possibility are shrinking and the other ones are increasing. So uh, 
the original fa first phase of AI was um, working by identifying problems that require us to be intelligent, like playing chess, and then implementing this as an algorithm. So it was basically the manual engineering of strategies for being intelligent in particular domains. And this somehow did not scale towards general intelligence, one algorithm to do it all. Mm -hmm. And there were subparts of this, like the logicist program, the idea to uh, come up with a language that allows you to have all possible valid thoughts. Same project as Wittgenstein, who completely preempted most of the work of Minsky in a way, uh, but a couple of decades earlier and then failed. And the philosophers largely didn't understand what he was up to because he had to publish this in this already dying discipline instead of waiting for AI. <laughs> and the AI people didn't really uh, understand that uh, this philosopher was actually trying to do AI briefly before church and Turing already understanding computation. Mm. He already understood that logic is sufficient to uh, build all the possible uh, representational systems and he could also replace all logic with NAND gates. He already knew that. Right, this is pretty amazing for a young guy back then. Okay, so uh, this first project, uh, program of AI did not accumulate all the way. And now we are in the second phase of AI. We no longer build these algorithms ourselves. We build algorithms that discover the algorithms. Right. right? We build learning systems that yeah. discover, that approximate functions. And deep learning has an unfortunate name. I think it should be called compositional functional approximation. <laughs> this sounds more like a mouthful. But it's, uh, it's also more narrow and more accurate. It's, it's about this thing that we don't just take a single function that we tune to like a regression, but that we are able to take many functions and put them behind each other or into networks of functions. So that is the big trick. And we can approximate some functions well and not others. It could be that there is a third phase where we no longer build the algorithms that discover the algorithms, that, but we go one step higher. We build the algorithms that discover the algorithms that discover the algorithms. We go for meta-learning. Right. In a way, our brain maybe is a meta-learning machine, not a system that can just learn stuff, that, but then discover how to learn stuff yeah. for a new domain. Dan Cooney College from the Max Planck Institute has this practopoiesis idea, which is basically learning about learning about learning kind of idea. Yeah, but at some point it stops. I don't think that you go, need to go for more than four degrees. Like at some point there's going to be a general theory of search that tells you how to get to the global optimum if the global optimum can be gotten to and you are a system with finite resources or basically how to optimize your chances of getting there. Once you have that algorithm, as a scientist you are done. There is no more science that we can do with integrity because it's just going to be the application of this algorithm. We can only do art then. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, our original, we are, we've been talking here for almost 90 minutes. So let me sort of hopefully bring our conversation to a close here within the next 10 minutes or so by sort of redirecting our attention to the original occasion of us getting together, which was a, a brief inter exchange we had, the two of us, uh, on Twitter about ethics. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this. Where does ethics fit in all of this or does it? I get sometimes frustrated when people think that ethics is about being good and being good means to emulate a good person, preferably the one who uh, has, uh, is talking about ethics. Did you get frustrated with me on Twitter? No. You're a good kid. Uh, <laughs> I'm one year younger than you, by the way. So <laughs> <laughs> It's not about age. I'm about 12. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, that's right. Okay. So okay. So uh, ethics, I think, is often misunderstood. Ethics emerges when you conceptualize the world as different agents and yourself as one of them. And uh, you share purposes with the other agents, but you have conflicts of interest. If you think that you don't share purposes with the other agents, if you're just a lone wolf and the others are your prey, there is no reason for ethics, right? There's only you look for the consequences of your actions for yourself with respect to your own rewards functions. And that might involve that you have to create a civilization of minions or whatever, but it's not the same thing as ethics. It's not a shared system of negotiation. It's for only one where you as an individual matter because you don't share that purpose with the others. But, but for it's instance, not shared, but it's your personal ethical framework, isn't it? Oh, it has to be personal. Uh, for instance, uh, I don't eat meat. 
um, maybe a legacy of, uh, decision that I made when I was 14 years old. Uh, because back then, uh, I felt that I share a purpose with animals. That is the avoidance of suffering, if it can be helped. And I also realized that it's not mutual. The animals don't care about my suffering. Don't Cows largely don't care that I suffer. They don't even conceptualize it. They don't think about it a lot. Mm -hmm. I had to think about a lot about the suffering of cows. I didn't want them to suffer, so I stopped eating meat. That was an ethical decision. It's a decision about how to resolve a conflict of interest under conditions of shared purpose. And I think this is what ethics is about. It's a rational process in which you negotiate with yourself and with others the resolution of conflicts of interest under conditions of shared purpose. And what purposes I share is in a way a decision. And I can make different decisions about what purposes we share. And some of them are sustainable and others are not. So they lead to different outcomes. But in this sense, ethics requires that you conceptualize yourself as something above the organism that you identify the systems of meanings above yourself so you can share a purpose love is the discovery of shared purpose there needs to be somebody you love other, that you can be ethical with at some level you need to love them you need to share a purpose with them and then you negotiate right you want, don't want them all to fail in all regards and yourself this is what ethics is about it's computational too machines can be ethical if they share a purpose with us and what about two other sort of consideration perhaps is that perhaps ethics can be a framework within which two uh, entities that do not share uh, interest can kind of negotiate in and uh, peacefully coexist while still not sh sharing interests. Well, not interests, but purposes. Or purposes. If you don't share purposes, then you are defecting against your own interest when you don't act on your own interest. It doesn't have integrity. If uh, somebody is your foot, uh, you should, uh, and you don't share a purpose with your foot other than you want it to be nice and edible. Right? right? If you then start giving presents to your foot and falling in love with your foot, it doesn't end well. Look at the little mermaid. The little mermaid is a siren. Uh, sirens eat people. You don't fall in love with your foot. It doesn't end well. <laughs> okay, but but me and you are both. I, I don't know if you're vegan or vegetarian. We both, me and you, don't eat meat. So we made that choice that perhaps cows don't share interest uh, or in us. We kind of are interested in diminishing their suffering, obviously, to make that decision. And yet we and they're our food, supposedly, if, if mm -hmm. that's the popular opinion anyway. And yet we've made that choice to stay away from beef or from meat in general. Mm -hmm. so, so we can find a framework within which two entities that, that don't share interests and our purposes together could perhaps peacefully coexist. And isn't that an ethical framework of its own right? It's more tricky. I mean, with the cows, the cows largely wouldn't exist if people would not eat them. You can make the argument that a uh, um, pasture living grass-fed cow has a uh, um, net positive existence, except for the last day, which is horrible, but it's horrible right. for most of us. Right. And uh, just that. Right. So this is one argument in favor of eating uh, pasture-fed cows. Right. Uh, another one is maybe you can manipulate the mental states of the cows so even the factory-fed uh, cows are happy. Uh, oh, right? So uh, is this unethical? It might look, not look very appetizing to you, but uh, then again, maybe people are in the same decision. We are a domesticated uh, species. This is what humanity is about. We give up agency of our own beliefs. You get manipulated in finding things uh, bearable that uh, look unbearable to a more feral human being like you and me. Right, it's a particular kind of domestication that didn't hold take hold on your brain. So is this unethical to implement this domestication by um, breeding uh, people or cattle in a particular way? It looks repulsive to us. But if we really care about the well-being of cattle, you and me should probably optimize slaughter houses to make them more humane, to make them more bearable. But we we look away from the slaughter houses because we find them very anesthetic. We don't want to have anything to do with this. And this is not the most ethical stance and we can figure that out. So ethics in a way is difficult. Of course, that's the key, that's the key point of ethics. And, and so even it seems to me that, that, that ethics requires sometimes we take choices which are not in our own best self-interest perhaps. Depends on what we define of ourselves. 
The self, uh, we could say this is identical to the well-being of the organism, but this is a very short-sighted perspective, mm -hmm. right? I don't actually identify all the way with my organism. Yeah. There are other things I identify with society, I identify with my kids, with my relationships, with my friends, and their well-being. So I am all the things that I identify with that I want to regulate in a particular way. And my children are objectively more important than me, right? If they have the choice to make my kids survive or myself, my kids should survive. Yeah. This is as it should be if nature has wired me up correctly. You can change the wiring, but uh, this is also the weird thing about ethics. Ethics becomes very tricky to discuss once the reward function becomes mutable. When you're able to change what is important to you, what you care about, how you define ethics. Me? So basically, Or anyone. I, I would say to me, let me be careful about this. Well, I would say it's basically, you can call it even a code of conduct or an, a, a, a set of principles and rules that guide my behavior to accomplish certain kind of outcomes. There are no beliefs without priors. Yes. What are the uh, priors that you base your code of conduct on? Yes, that's, that's a very good question. And, and it puts me on the spot here and I'm not prepared for it, but I have to follow. Uh, so uh, the priors are, you can call them axioms, perhaps. Things like diminishing suffering. Things like, uh, for example, uh, and perhaps one of those uh, rules or points of view or, or tools, if you will, is taking sort of what Peter Singer calls the universe points of view, point of view or uh, sort of an outside point of view than my own, right? So when it comes to, to with respect to cows, I take a point of view outside of me and the cows, hopefully, and, and sort of I'm able to look at, at my suffering of not eating a cow and their suffering of being eaten, right? So if my prior is minimize suffering, because basically that's the axiom based on which I can deduce that something or someone exists like a living entity, like a sentient being, right? Is the suffering, does it suffer? That's, that's sort of my test, if you will. Not during test, but a test of, of, of being a sentient being. Can you suffer? Can it suffer? And if it can suffer, then my principle of minimizing suffering must be the, the guiding principle with which I relate to it. That's kind of like, if you will, sort of the foundation of my personal ethics. Can it suffer? Then the next is how can I minimize the suffering of that entity? And then basically everything else builds up from there. Right. When you become an adult, I think, Uh, the most important part of it is that you take charge of your own emotions. You realize that your own emotions are generated by your own brain, by your own organism, and they're here to serve you. You're not here to serve your emotions. Your, the emotions are there to help you on doing, for doing the things that you consider to be the right thing. Mm -hmm. And that means that you need to be able co to control them, to have integrity. If you are just the victim of your emotions and not do the things that are the right thing, you learn that you can't control your emotions and deal with them, right? You, you don't have integrity. Right. And what is suffering? Pain is the result of some part of your brain sending a teaching signal to another part of your brain to improve its performance. If the regulation is not correct because you cannot actually regulate that particular thing, then the pain will endure and usually get cranked up until your brain figures it out and turns off the pain signaling center by telling him, actually, you're not helping here, right? Until you get to this point, you have suffering. You have increased pain that you cannot resolve. And so in this sense, suffering is a lack of integrity. The difficulty is only that many beings cannot get to the degree of integrity where they can control the application of learning signals in their brain, where they can control the way the reward function is being computed and distributed. So isn't suffering, then, then according to your argument, suffering is just like you said before, a, a simulation or a part of a simulation then? Right? Well, everything that we experience is a simulation. We are a right. simulation. But to us, of course, it feels real. There right. is no helping around this. But uh, 
what I have learned in the course of my life is that all of my suffering is the result of not being awake. Once I wake up, I realize what's going on. I realize that I am a mind. The relevance of the signals that I perceive is completely up to the mind. Because the universe does not give me objectively good or bad things. The universe gives me a bunch of electrical impulses that manifest on, uh, in my thalamus and my brain makes sense of them by creating a simulated world. And the valence in that simulated world is completely internal. It's completely part of that world. It's not objective. Right. And so I can control right. this. Right. So ethics is, is a subject or suffering is a subjective experience. And if I'm basing my uh, ethics on suffering, therefore my ethics would be subjective. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I, no, I think that uh, suffering is real with respect to the self, but it's not immutable. Sure. So you can ch change the definition of yourself, the things that you identify with. Imagine there is a certain condition in the world where you think a particular party needs to be in power in order for the world to be good. And if that party is not in power, you suffer. You can give up that belief and you realize how politics actually works and that uh, there's a fitness function going on and that people behave according to what they read and whatever. And you realize that this is the case and you just give up on suffering about it because you realize you are looking at a mechanical process and it plays out anyway, regardless of what you feel about how that plays out, right? So you give up that suffering. Or if you are a preschool teacher and the kids are misbehaving and they are mean to you, at some point you stop suffering about this because you see what they actually do. It's right. not personal. But right? Stoics, that's, that's what Stoic philosophy is all about, right? Stoics say there is no point. So first of all, uh, Stoics say that, that we suffer not from events or things that happen in our life, but from the stories that we attach to, to them. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if we change the story, we can change the, the, the way we feel about them and there, thereby remove the suffering. And they say that there's the only thing that we can focus on and do something about is our own thoughts and things like the kids in school or the party are things that are completely outside of our control. And therefore, there's no point to get aggravated about them. And there's very little things that are completely under our control. So we can't really control fully our body. We can't really control our health completely. Things can always go wrong there. The only thing they say you can fully, completely control is your thoughts. And that's where your freedom comes to be. And that's where your uh, power comes to be. And that's where you have, you, you're the one and only. Right in that mind, in that simulation, you're the god. <laughs> so this ability to make your thoughts more truthful, this is Western enlightenment in a way. This is Aufklärung in German, and there is also this other sense of enlightenment, Erleuchtung, that you have in a spiritual context. And so Aufklärung fixes your rationality, and Erleuchtung fixes your motivation. It fixes what's relevant to you and how you relate to this. It fixes the relationship between self and universe. And uh, often they are seen as mutually exclusive in the sense that uh, Aufklärung uh, leads to nihilism because you don't give up your need for meaning. You just prove that it cannot be satisfied. God does not exist in any way that can set you free. And uh, in this other sense, you give up your understanding of how the world actually works so you can be happy. You go to a non-dual state where you represent that all people share the same cosmic consciousness, which is complete bullshit, right? But it's uh, something that removes uh, the illusion of separation and the suffering that comes with the separation and so on. Uh, so so where, the, where's that leave yeah, us? Yeah, sustainable. Where's that leave us with respect to ethics, though? Like, So maybe you were able to dismantle much or most or maybe all of my ethics. Did you? Uh I don't know all of your ethics, but... Well, if, if you ask me for the foundation and the best I could come up with the, the sort of the suffering test. Yeah, it's not good. Um, the problem is really that if I can turn off suffering um, or if I get counterintuitive results, there's this uh, antinatalism. Uh, antinatalism is an obvious way to end suffering, right? Stop have, uh, putting new organisms into the world and end sure. the existing set of organisms in the least painful way possible, right? AI could help with this. The question is, uh, can we make it safe or is the AI going to leave a couple cells left that can give rise to new suffering later on? But, but so if you have a completely cold and death, dead universe, then there'll be no suffering, right? Yes. So, and so, is this what you want? Right, clearly. So that's not the most, 
according to not so question. clear i'm an antinatalist but my kids are not so i have this uh <laughs> that division there but uh so what's that what's that say about where are you coming from then with respect to ethics so let's say my suffering test is not good enough i think existence by itself is neutral Uh, the reason why we uh, why there are so few Stoics around, have you thought about this? Stoicism has been discovered a long time ago. Almost nobody is a Stoic. How is that? Well, I know I know a few people who are Stoics, actually. Yeah, but the majority is not. Well, it seems to be so obvious. Only worry about the things that you can actually change to the degree that the worry helps you changing them. Yeah. So. So. So why is nobody a Stoic? Almost nobody. Well, I wouldn't say nobody. I'd say a few people are stoic and they're amazing and they're they're inspirational and and they're motivational and they're good role model for for sort of like how I want to behave and how I want to live and how I want to act in this world. Wow. I suspect that stoicism is maladaptive from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, most cats I have known are stoics. Which means if you leave them alone, they're fine. Like their baseline state is okay. They're okay with themselves and their place in the universe, and they just stay at that place. And only when you disturb that, because they need to use the bathroom, or because they are hungry, or uh, they want to play, or whatever, this equilibrium gets disturbed, and they do what exactly what's necessary to get back to the equilibrium state, and then they're fine again. And a human being is slightly different. Uh, a healthy human being is set up in such a way that in, when they wake up in the morning, they're not completely fine. And then they need to be busy during the day, but in the evening, they're fine. Right? In the evening, it's done enough to uh, make peace with existence again. And then they can have a beer and meet with their friends and everything is good. And uh, then there are some individuals which uh, have so much discontent within themselves. Right? The human is the animal that is discontent that they cannot take care of this in a single day, right? Even after several weeks of sustained work, they are still in a state where it's not good enough. And only when they have this amazing thing where they get their Nobel Prize, they're fine for like half a day. Yeah. And uh, the way this is, the way we are set up to different degrees. And from an evolutionary perspective, you can totally see why that would be useful for a group species. For a indivi- uh, species that is not so much a group species, like cats are not really meant for groups. They're very much singletons. Uh, for them, it's rational to be a stoic. But if you're a group animal, it makes sense that the well-being of the individual is sacrificed for the well-being of the group. So each individual is overextending themselves to make the group more successful and produce a surplus of resources for the group as a result. Right, but evolution also diversifies things so that if one kind of feature becomes maladaptive in a, in a new environmental change, then a diverse part of that population would be more adaptive and so mm-hmm. on. That's why evolution sort of hedges its bets with the, the greatest variety and diversity possible, right? So yeah, there will be some people who would be like that and some people who would be like uh, otherwise. And, and this way, on the whole, they're evolutionarily most adaptive. But some would be more adaptive to one kind of situation and others would be more adaptive to other kinds of situation. I'm not sure if this is true. So, for instance, we find that larger habitats don't necessarily have more species in them. And that's because there is a fiercer competition, which means that there is less slack in the evolution. So, for instance, New Zealand had a lot of species before uh, there was immigration of other species and they obliterated most of the stuff that existed. Right. Mostly because the stuff that came in was the result of a much fiercer competition that existed in small New Zealand. Sure, yeah. And in a way, the same thing happens now. Um, we are the result of evolution. We are, as yeah. Minsky said, evolution's way to uh, uh, put uh, the uh, uh, airplanes into the sky and uh, make these clouds that the airplanes uh, planes make. And we reduce the number of species dramatically. We are like probably eventually going to be look like a meteor that is going to obliterate a large part of the species on this planet. So, so what's that say about ethics and technology? So is there, so what's the, what's the solution then? So is there space for ethics in technology? Or of ethics? course there is. It's about uh, discovering the long game, right? So when you do something, you have short influences and you have long influences And based on what you think is the right thing to do, you need to look at the long-term influences. But you also need to question why you think that something is the right thing to do, what the results of that are, which gets tricky. Uh, 
But we can agree on that. That's that's fantastic. But tell me then, how do you define ethics yourself? Well, um, the tension between uh, the way I define ethics and some other people in AI and ethics in AI define it is there are some people which think that ethics is a way for politically savvy people to get power over STEM people. <laughs> and uh, right with considerable success, it's largely a protection racket. There is also a way that uh, ethics happens where you have studies where somebody asks a million people of whether a traffic driving car should run over young people or old people first. Right. And then they publish the results and it makes a big splash because people can relate to this. We but uh, it's... Uh, it, ethics. We right? That. This is just happens that, so that philosophers had this trolley problem and suddenly they see an application. But it's largely the same thing as saying that the majority of people would want a mine or tower uh, to be confined in labyrinths rather than in public forests. Right. right? That, that is the, the situation that the, uh, that the gods were in or the Cretan king was in when the sun turned out to be a minotaur. But it rarely happens. Right? In the same sense, it rarely happens that a self-driving car will have to make that decision. Probably not often enough to uh, require an if-then in its code. But but how do you define ethics for yourself? What is ethics? Because you asked me this and I gave my best to answer. Oh, so I also try to do this. My best answer is that ethics is the principled negotiation of conflicts of interest under conditions of shared purpose. If okay. I share purposes with others, with society, with other beings, with conscious beings, and that's my decision based on the way my mind is set, set up right now, and I run into conflicts of interest with them, uh, I have to deal with this. For instance, when I look at other people, I mostly imagine myself uh, as being them in a different timeline. Everybody is in a way me in a different timeline, but in order to understand who they are, I need to flip a number of bits. So I think about which, uh, which bits would I need to flip in my mind to be you. Right. So and these are the conditions of negotiation that I have with you. So, so we can agree on that perhaps, on that definition, but then where do the cows fit in? Because we don't have a shared purpose with them. So how can you have ethics with respect to the cows then? The, the shared purpose doesn't objectively exist. Uh, a shared purpose means that you basically project a shared meaning above the level of your ego, your ego being the function that integrates expected rewards over the next 50 years. Well, exactly. That's what Peter Singer calls the, 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 the universe point of view, perhaps. Yeah, well, if you can go to this eternalist perspective where you integrate expected reward from here to infinity... Most of that being outside of the universe. This leads to uh, very weird things. Most of my friends are eternalists in a way, right? All these romantic Russian Jews, we are like that in a way. This, uh, this Eastern European shape of the soul. Uh, it uh, creates uh, something like a conspiracy. It creates a tribe and it's very useful for cooperation. So shared meaning is a very important thing for cooperation that is non-transactional. But it's, there's a certain kind of... Uh, illusion in it to me meaning is like the ring of mordor <laughs> so you have to carry it if if you drop the ring you will lose the brotherhood of the ring and you will lose your mission you have to carry it but very lightly if you put it on you will get superpowers you bet but you get corrupted because there is no meaning you get drawn into a cult that you create wow and i don't want to do that right because it's going to shackle my mind in ways that i don't want it to be bound I really, really like that way of saying, but I'm trying to extrapolate from your sort of definition of ethics, a guide of how we can treat the cows and hopefully how the AIs can treat us within that same definition, right? That's what I'm trying to push here and see if that's possible at all. Oh, okay, so there is... Um... Because my claim is that the way we treat cows probably is like another way of like how AIs could possibly treat us. I think that some people have this idea similar to Asimov that at some point the boomers will become larger and more powerful so we can make them washing machines or let them do our shopping or let them do our nursing and then we will still enslave them and will negotiate the conditions of coexistence with them. And I don't think this is what's going to happen primarily. What's going to happen is that corporations which are already intelligent agents that just happen to borrow human intelligence automate their decision making. At the moment, a human being can often outsmart a corporation uh, because the corporation uh, has so much time in between updating its um, Excel spreadsheets 
and the next weekly meetings. Now imagine it automates everything and the weekly meetings take place every millisecond. And this thing becomes sentient, understands its role in the world and the nature of the world and physics and everything else because it has scalable intelligence. We will not be able to outsmart that anymore. And it, we will not live next to it. We will live inside of it. Intelligence will come, the AI will come from top down on us. We will live not next to it, but inside. We will be its gut flora. And the question is how we can negotiate that it doesn't get the ideas to use antibiotics because we're actually not good for anything. Exactly. And, and why wouldn't they do that? I don't see why. So uh, some people made the suggestion. Uh, there was AI ethics that could guide them to treat uh, us just like you decided to treat the cows when you turned 14 and you decided not to eat meat? Maybe. Imagine there are a bunch of orangutans that sit in the forest in Borneo and decide to breed the smartest members over a few generations to get people. And uh, they uh, see the big risk of that because they are already smart enough to glimpse that. And they try to come up with a code that they would give on their offspring to make sure that their offspring will never go against the orangutans. This is probably not successful because we don't have the ability to outsmart beings that are many magnitudes smarter than us. We can make some mathematical proofs, but uh, I don't see an obvious proof that we will find a way to build a system that uh, guarantees that all these AIs will not uh, turn against us. No, no, we can I agree. make some AI safe, but I don't see how we can make all the AI safe that will be built. I, I agree. I agree with that. I'm just trying to see if there's any possible scenario which could treat us kindly because perhaps AIs could have their AI ethics. And according to that AI ethics, they would treat, treat us as, as a means, not as an end. Uh, and, 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 and just like you decided to treat cows kindly, they may decide to treat us, but I'm just wondering. And so I'm trying to bring ethics into the relationship, not only between human and cows, but AI and humans. So the thing is that we, you decided to define ethics as axiomatically. And you, I think, probably have a hunch that your axiomatic definition is not completely consistent with itself. It's just the best you came up with under the circumstances. For instance, if you really go after eliminating suffering, uh, you should probably put some anesthetic uh, in the, into the water supply globally to uh, alleviate suffering and then let everybody face happily out of existence in a way. That would satisfy this goal in an optimal way. And it's probably not what you want. So you also want to preserve human aesthetics, maybe. And to preserve these human aesthetics, the shape of the mind that we have and this consciousness that we have is going to create some suffering. And this is the tension. And you have to make a decision at some point, right? Imagine you take an AI that uh, is actually sustainable. And you ask this AI, you know, we give you a job. You want to be around in 10 years, years from now. We cannot build a government that cares about us being around 10,000 years from now effectively, right? Because this is not an incentive that you can actually give the government. And if it understands this incentive, it's going to defect from the incentive that we wanted to have. So let's build an AI. And the AI is going to be around in 10,000 years from now, no problem. We tell it, make sure that we are there too. And the AI is probably going to kill 90% of us, hopefully painlessly, and breed everybody else into some kind of harmless yeast. So they're easy to keep around. This is not what you want, I guess, right? even though it would be consistent with your stated axioms. So getting the axioms consistent is super hard. There's and problems, for sure. Yeah. And, and even with the code, the best, most ethical, according to my own argument, the most, the best, most ethical universe would be a cold dead universe because there'll be no possibility of suffering there, right? That's clearly a problem. Yes. And now if, the next thing with the suffering axiom is that uh, the suffering is important because you think of it as something that cannot be turned off by itself. So we basically think of suffering as something that is not the choice of the one who suffers because why would you want to suffer, right? So it's something that the universe does to you and we have to change the conditions of the universe in which you are in so you don't suffer. But what we forget about this, that suffering is an evolutionary adaptation. It's created to make you jump through all these hoops in order to eat more and eat others. Right? It's a, a very perverse thing. And you can turn off the suffering. As soon as you become conscious enough and awake enough, you can deal with it and get rid of your suffering. And so at, at some point in your mental development, suffering becomes a choice. And for the other animals... What it, is all about, yeah. Yeah. So you could think, okay, one thing that we want to do is we want to wake up as many organisms as possible to give them that choice. 
to exactly. give them agency over their suffering. And uh, this will then open another Pandora's box of ethical conundrums. Yes. But uh, on a very short range, maybe we don't need to make these decisions right now, right here, right? We can basically operate in a framework where we agree with our loved ones about shared purposes and shared systems of meanings and want to operate within those. And in these narrow constraints, we can get ethics to work. I don't see how to get ethics to work globally. Right, right. So, Joshua, it's been a fascinating two-hour conversation with you. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm not surprised that I rediscovered that I don't know. Uh, I've been mostly aware, though occasionally I forget that I really don't know. Thank you for reminding me that. Uh, tell me, where can people find more about you and your work? There's some on YouTube. I'm also uh, getting myself to write a book, hopefully, uh, these days. What's the book about? Um, I basically try to get a glimpse on this civilizational intellect, on this hive mind that we have been created and that uh, makes sense of some of the concepts that are broken in our culture, like ideas that bro um, are broken, our mind, consciousness, self, meaning, and we don't know how to talk about them. And AI has discovered how to talk about them. Huh. AI has discovered and we don't know. Oh, I think that basically our poll is largely doesn't know. There are many people which do know. But we, I think we need to carry these ideas together in one place so we can talk about them without getting too excited about them or upset. Because it's not about giving meaning to people's lives or something. It's not about uh, building... Uh, better self-driving cars at some level it's about understanding who we are and uh, what our relationship to reality is and okay. AI has figured out a few things that we didn't know a hundred years ago yeah but but that isn't that figuring out who you are isn't that giving you meaning no uh, it's much better I discover what the nature of meaning is I discover how this is wired into my brain and it's in a way becoming an adult The sta first stage in the maturity of a mind and maybe the last stage is where you discover what you are, how you are built, what you actually, how you function, your own nature. Well, Joshua, I, I want to talk, I want to talk to you for another two hours. So perhaps I you hope can. One day. <laughs> We can set up another date further down yes, the line. I hope to do that in person, actually, hopefully soon. Uh, but in the meantime, how do we wrap up this two-hour conversation with you? What's the sort of most important thing or the single message that you want to send away our audience with today? Who is our audience? Well, who do you want your audience to be? You can send a message to anybody. My audience is my audience, but you can they have their very wide diversity of people. Lots of IT, basically geeks, nerds. Uh, transhumanists, cryonicists, futurists, IT professionals, uh, philosophers, engineers, curious. Okay, people. so something very simple and boring. I think that uh, the field of AI is largely misunderstood because there are two industries, the AI hype industry and the anti-AI hype industry, which have very little to do with AI. The practice of AI is, uh, in a way, statistics on steroids. It's experimental statistics. It's identifying new functions to model reality. And that is what statistics is doing. And largely, it hasn't gotten to the point yet where it can make proofs of optimality. So it's largely experimental. But it can do things that are much better than the established tools of, uh, of statisticians. And this in itself is not so exciting. There's also going to be a convergence between um, econometrics causal dependency analysis, and uh, AI, and statistics. It's all going to be the same in a particular way because there's only so many ways in which you can make mathematics about reality. And uh, we confuse this uh, with the idea of what a mind is. And they're closely related because I think that our brain contains an AI that uh, is making a model of reality and a model of a person in reality. And this particular solution of what an AI can do, this particular thing in the modeling space, this is what we are. So in a way, we need to understand the nature of AI, which I think is the nature of somewhat general function approximation. 
sufficiently general function approximation, maybe all of the function approximation that can be made in the long run, right? All the truths that can be found by an embedded observer in particular kinds of universes that have the power to create it. This could be the question of what AI is about, how modeling works in general. And for us, the relevance of AI is how uh, does it explain us who we are? And I don't think that there is anything else that can. So let me see if I get this right, just, just because to see if I can sort of simplify and, and I'm probably going to fail. But so we need to understand the nature of AI. That's kind of your call. But then you, you said that we are in a way an AI. Is that the case? No, the brain is an AI. I am a self. A self is a model that uh, the mind has created inside of my brain. Right. So that's a little AI instantiation. Yes. And then if we create that other AI that we're talking about, it would perhaps give us a glimpse of this other AI in here, mm -hmm. kind of. Yes. And we would understand the nature of our AI in here by creating that other AI. Out Actually, there. we already do. So uh, the things that Minsky and many others have contributed to this field and that the things that we are talking about right now, uh, are already a much better understanding that humanity had, well, that our part of humanity, our civilization had a couple hundred years ago. Many of these ideas we could only uh, develop because we began to understand the nature of modeling, the nature of our relationship to the outside world, the status of reality. Like we started out from this dualist intuition in our culture, mm -hmm. that there is a, a res extensa and a res cogitans, a thinking substance and a extended substance, the stuff in space universe and the universe of ideas. And we now realize that they both exist, but they both exist within the mind. Part of uh, what we have in the mind is uh, stuff in this free space. Everything perceptual gets mapped to a region in three space. We also now understand physics. Physics is not a free space. It's something else entirely. The free space is only apparent as the space of potential electromagnetic interactions at a certain order of magnitude uh, of scaling above the Planck lengths, where we are entangled with the universe. Our minds are entangled with the universe, right? Mm -hmm. This is what we model. And this looks three-dimensional to us. And everything else that our mind comes up with is stuff that cannot be mapped onto region into three space. This is res cogitans. So in a way, we transfer, transfer this dualism into a single mind. Then we have the idealistic monism that we have in many spiritual teachings. This idea that, we, that there is no physical reality, that we live in a dream. Yeah. That we are characters in a dream dreamt by a mind on a higher plane of existence and that's why miracles are possible. Yeah. And then there is this Western perspective of a mechanical universe that is entirely mechanical. There's no right. conspiracy going on. Right. And uh, now we understand that these things are not in opposition. They are complements. We actually do live in a dream, but the dream is generated by a neocortex. Right? So our brain is not a machine that can give us access to reality as it is, because that's not possible for a system that is only measuring a few bits at the systemic interface. There is no colors and sounds that fit through your nerves. We already know that. The right. sounds and colors are generated as a dream inside of your brain. The same circuits that make dreams at night make dreams during the day. Right. So this, in a way, is our inner reality that's being created on the brain. The uh, mind on the higher plane of existence exists. It's uh, the brain of a primate that is made from cells and lives in a mechanical, physical universe. And magic is possible because you can edit your memories. Right? You can make that simulation anything you want it to be. It's just many of these changes are not sustainable. That's why uh, the sages warn against using magic. Because uh, down the line, if you change your reward function, bad things may happen. Mm -hmm. You cannot break the bank. So, so let me see if I, if I can simplify all of this in a, in a sentence. So, and if you agree with it. So we need to understand the nature of AI in order to understand ourselves. Yeah. Is that it? So, well, I would say that AI is the field that took up the slack after psychology failed as a science. Psychology got terrified of overfitting. So it stopped making theories of the mind as a whole. It restricted itself to theories with very, many, uh, very few free parameters. So it could test them. And even those largely didn't replicate, as we know now. Mm -hmm. So after Piaget's uh, psychology largely didn't go anywhere in my perspective. It might be too harsh because I see it from the outside and outsiders of AI might also argue that AI didn't go very far. 
And as an insider, I'm more partial here. And maybe uh, my, I have too much bias and give it too much credit. But uh, to me, most of the things I've learned by looking at the world through this lens of seeing us as information processing systems. So you agree with, with the statement summary that I made? Yeah. Okay. Because I, I have this metaphor that I use every once in a while, uh, saying that technology is a magnifying mirror. It's, it doesn't have an essence of its own, but it reflects the essence that we put in it. Uh, and of course, it's not a perfect image because it magnifies and it amplifies things. So I think it's a, it's a call. It's it's it, it's a, it's a, th those could be mutually supportive, right? Because you're saying we need to understand the nature of AI to understand who we are, and I, I like that very much, actually. Yeah, but just the practice of AI is 90 degree. It's automating statistics, and making better statistics that run automatically on machines. And it just so happens that this thing is largely co-extensional with what minds do. And it also just so happens that AI was largely founded as a discipline by people like Minsky to understand the nature of our minds because they had fundamental questions about our relationships to reality. Right. And what's the last 10%? Of what? Other than statistics, you said it's it's 90% statistics. What's the rest? Oh, uh, the rest is people coming up with dreams about our relationship to reality using the uh, concepts that we develop in AI. Right, so we identify models of uh, things that we can apply in other fields. It's the deeper insights that we actually go for. Hmm. Right, Most of the what we do in AI is about applications. It's about utility down the line. But there are these things why we really do it. The thing that Feynman said that make physics like sex also makes AI like sex. <laughs> Sometimes something useful comes from it, a new better way to make self-driving cars or uh, play Jeopardy or uh, help people in many circumstances in their life or to make better uh, agents running on your phone. It's not why we do it. We want to understand how we work. Right, and that's a brilliant place to end our conversation because I feel the same way about philosophy, by the way, that, you know, Uh, it's just like Feynman felt about physics and you feel about AI. I feel the same way about philosophy. And uh, yeah, so these remaining 10% are in a way philosophy. But in like all of these fields, most of the practitioners are trained in the main methodology of their field. So our philosophy tends to be bad. Yeah. And I think my job is to try to make it slightly better to the degree that I can. And that, does that mean by extension that Of course, most physics then would be bad and most AI then would be bad because they fall within that 90%. No, no. I, I think the AI uh, as a practi uh, practical thing can be very good, right? Most physicists are not concerned with foundational physics, with the nature of the universe. Most physicists are concerned with material science or many, many other extremely practical things. Yeah. It's only a very small minority that worries about the deepest things. And the same thing happens in AI or in neuroscience. And it's not that there anybody is to blame for doing the relevant things. It's actually very good that uh, a lot of people are willing to put up with the relevant things and take down the garbage. Right. And I'm grateful to them. To them. It's just I can't do that myself somehow. I, I think, as you put, I, I would probably go extinct. Uh, yeah. Because... And it's not a source of pride in a way. It's uh, the recognition of a disability. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, it's a bug. <laughs> yeah. But it has, uh, it's uh, marginally useful because society needs a few of us. I so, so. Right, it does. I mean, we're still here. <laughs> we're here, but it's a struggle sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but this is our own choice how much we struggle because objectively we are here and the coffee is good. Thank you for reminding me that. And I, I love the coffee. I'm, I'm a coffee fanatic. I, I, yeah, that's a whole other story, but I, I'm a coffee fanatic. Joshua Bach. Thank you so much for spending over two hours with us today. I'm looking forward to our next conversation and I wish you the very best uh, while the party is lasting. Likewise. It was such a great conversation. Thank you for this time we spent together. If you guys enjoyed this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes or you can simply make a donation.